Hey Chemistry, Mrs. KJ here, and we're going to go over the Unit 1 lab for Semester 2, Stoichiometry Lab Report. And as a reminder, we want to look at our vocabulary word, precipitate. So a precipitate is a solid that forms as a result of a chemical reaction between two aqueous solutions. So what do we mean by aqueous solutions? We mean that something is dissolved in water, or in other words, Two liquids combine, have a chemical reaction, and make a solid. Stoichiometry links amounts of reactants and products. So in other words, we're going to talk about how much of each element is present before the reactant and after the product, a chemical reaction. So in our chemical equation, the arrow points to the product. So knowing how to balance and use chemical equations to predict unknown amounts of reactants or products when given one or more of them is a practical skill. Now you will see how this knowledge can be applied in the laboratory where you will combine reactants in a quantitative manner and estimate the amounts of product. In other words, we're going to add different amounts of reactants and we're going to see how that affects the amount of products that are produced. So the goal is to determine stoichiometric relationships of chemical reactions. And stoichiometric, like stoichiometry, just talks about the fact that how much do we have before a reaction has to equal how much we have after the reaction. Stoichiometry deals with the quantitative aspects of chemical reactions. So quantitative, quantity, means how much. Stoichiometry is the branch of chemistry that examines the quantitative relationship between components in a com chemical reaction. In other words, again, how much we have before we do the reaction and how much does it produce for our products. The process involves using information from the chemical equation to determine the amount of reactants that will produce a given amount of products. These amounts should correspond to the whole number coefficients, also called stoichiometric coefficients, used to balance the chemical equation. Therefore, it is important to start with a balanced chemical equation. All right, so they call this the Haber process. So you have one molecule, because there's a one in front of here, although they don't show it. So one molecule of N2, which is a gas, plus three molecules of H2, a gas, yields two molecules of NH3. And if we look, how many atoms of nitrogen are on the left side? Two. How many atoms of nitrogen are on the right side? Well, we distribute this and there are two. How many atoms of hydrogen are on the left or reactant side? Well, each molecule has two atoms because it's H2 and there are three copies of that. So we have six total hydrogens. Over on this side, we have NH3 and we have two copies of it. So we have how many total hydrogens? Two times three is six. Okay, so we have two more equations down here. We have forming water and forming salt. And I drew some molecules up here. So take a look at that and which equation do these describe? Do they describe 2H2 plus O2 yields 2H2O? Or does it describe 2Na plus one molecule of Cl2 yields 2NaCl? And the answer is this one is the salt because you can see I have two separate NAs. So two copies of Na. I have one copy of Cl2. So there's two atoms of Cl bonded together. And then it makes two copies of NaCl. So again, NaCl, NaCl. So even though they're in different forms, we can see that each side has two NAs, each side has two Cl, so they are balanced. And that's the whole point of stoichiometry, is making sure that it's balanced so we can see how much we need in order to produce however much. So if we look at water, there's two molecules of H2. So that means there'd be two copies of something that looks like this, plus one O2, so one copy of something that looks like this, plus two molecules of H2O would, of course, look like that. All right. 
reactants are often limited. In other words, you usually don't have barrels and barrels of this stuff. You only have so much because it costs money and it takes up space to have it. So you have to have the correct amount to make the correct amount of product that you need. Reactants are often limited. As soon as a reaction starts, reactants begin to get used up and products begin to form. But when does the reaction have to stop? The reaction must stop as soon as one of the reactants runs out. The reactant that runs out first is called the limiting reactant or limiting reagent. To determine which reactant is the limiting reactant, take these steps. One, convert quantities of each reactant to quantities of moles. Two, determine how many moles of product can be produced from each reagent, assuming there is an excess of each other reagent and multiply by the appropriate mole ratio. Three, check the results. The reactant that will produce the least amount of product in moles is the limiting reagent and will run out first. So if you just listen to me read that and just went, what, I'm just gonna stop now? No, 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 no stopping, we're gonna go through it. It's not so bad. It's like most of chemistry, there's a pattern, once we follow it through, it's not so bad and we'll get through it together. Now you might remember first semester when we talked about the cars and the tires. Every time you make a car, how many tires does it need? Four. Okay, so if I have eight tires, how many cars can I make? Two. If I have 12 tires, how many cars can I make? Three. If I have 14 tires, how many cars can I make? Well, I can still only make three cars, but I would have two leftover tires. So because I ran out of cars before tires, we would call the cars the limiting reagent, and we have excess or extra tires. That's the same thing here in chemistry. Okay, so let's look at an example with chemistry. So we are going to drop the tablets into the water until we run out of tablets and drip water onto the tablet. So let's look at these two things. So in this case, I'm going to pick up the tablets and dump them in. And we wanna look at which one runs out first. Do the tablets run out first or does the water run out first? We know it's a chemical reaction because what do you notice? Bubbles. And so they're chemically reacting and it's gonna keep going and keep going and keep going until we run out of what? Tablets. So in this case, the tablet is our limiting reactant because it got used up first. Now here I have just a little bit of water on this tablet and the water line is right there. It's kinda hard to see. There you can see the water line went down and when I drop it on, how do we know we have a chemical reaction? Because of the bubbles. And in this case, which one ran out first, the tablet or the bubble, or the water, sorry. <laughs> the water ran out first, and that tells us that the water is the limiting reactant. So whichever one runs out first is the limiting reactant. Okay, so we're gonna look at various reactions. In this laboratory exercise, you will conduct three types of double displacement reactions. Ooh, what do double displacement mean again? That means that they are going to switch partners. So if I'm combining CuNO3 with FeSO4, the Cu is gonna pair up with the SO4, and the Fe is gonna pair up with the NO3. So they're gonna switch partners. So combine various amounts of aqueous or liquid solutions. In this case, we're going to use sodium hydroxide with copper 2 nitrate, iron 2 sulfate, or iron nitrate. We're going to write balance equations for each reaction so we can see how much we're supposed to have of everything. We're going to use the equations to predict the appearance of products in each reaction well. You can see here there was definitely different amounts of reaction happening as we go across. Observe the chemical reactions between them. Do they form a precipitate? And what is a precipitate? The chunky solid that forms when two liquids chemically combine. Or do they change color? That would also be another signification of a chemical reaction. Use your observations to deduce some of the stoichiometric relationships. In other words, if I have so much of this one and so much of that one, what happens? So the picture in each well, various combinations of reactants will produce products that will change color. You will balance and use chemical equations to predict the amounts of product. All right, so in this one, we're gonna do nine reactions. And if you notice, we have two chemicals, copper two nitrate and sodium hydroxide. We're gonna start with five 
drops, then 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. And then we're going to go opposite with this one. 45 drops, 40 drops, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. If I add up how many total drops I'm putting, 45 plus 5 equals 50. 40 plus 10 equals 50. 35 plus 15 equals 15. 30 plus 20 equals 50. So as you can see, even up here, 5 plus 45 equals 50. We always have the same total amount. We just have various combinations of my two chemicals. All right, so let's go ahead and start with that. And we're going to start with copper 2 nitrate, and we're just going to go 5 drops. And then 10 drops. And how many drops here? 15. Okay, now this is going to take me a little while to do, so I'm going to hit pause, and then I'm going to fill all these up, and then I'll start our recording again. Okay, so I already added this whole column of copper nitrate, and now we have to add this column of sodium hydroxide. So we're going to start with 45. Four, 45. All right. And then we need 40 in this one because it always has to add up to 20. So, ooh, and we can see we already have a reaction, so that's good. in this one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. All right, now we need 30 in this one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. And then 25 in this one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. How many in this one? 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. How many in this one? 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. How many in this one? 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And how many in this one? And before we do, did that have a chemical reaction? Yeah, even though there's no precipitates, there's no little chunks, it changed color. So we still have a chemical reaction, just not enough to make a precipitate. All right, and the last one, there should only be five. One, two, three, four, five. All right, we'll wait for a second. And oh, that one had a chemical reaction too. Now, you can see that it didn't just disappear when I click on it from the side. Okay, and we can see that here, here. And here, oh, and this one. Now this one, what do we notice is different. It has a precipitate, it has, oops, chunks at the bottom. And so do these, wells four, three, two, and one all have precipitates. And what color would we say the precipitate is? We would say it's a dark blue and the liquid is light blue. All right, so now we need to write down some observations. All right, so did the color change and was there a precipitate? If yes, describe it. So in well number one, did the color change? Yep, it was a lighter blue liquid. 
and we can say that for well two, 